let us get into our second session. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Beth Schusler. Uh, she is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Tennessee. So Beth completed a BS in biology at Vanderbilt and then was trained as a botanist at Louisiana State University. And she had a cool path through informal science education before starting at the tenure track position. So she's worked my favorite at a swamp nature park sure. where you led field trips which is the coolest, um, and found her way back to a tenure track role at University of Tennessee, where she and her group are exploring student perceptions of anxiety and persistence, and then their perceptions of instructor supportiveness. So we're going to hear a little bit about that. Uh, and without further ado, take it away, Beth. Perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here today giving this talk. Um, this is going to be about how and why I think emotion is the hidden curriculum um, in our classrooms. And I'm gonna be supporting that with some research that my group has been doing on student anxiety. This is specific to introductory biology classes at the University of Tennessee, so a large R1 institution. Before I get going too far, I want to stop and acknowledge the folks that have helped me with this work. Um, ben England and Jennifer Brigatti have been um, longstanding collaborators on this work. Uh, Miranda and Mary Rose are recently kind of um, came in and started doing some of the work on instructors support. Marguerite, Caroline, and Hope have all been really instrumental in kind of um, helping us get out of our own heads and um, introduce new ideas and lab meetings. And we always want to thank the instructors and students of the Biology 150 and 160 classes at the University of Tennessee. Without them, we would have no data. Um, early funding for this work um, was provided through um, University of Tennessee and also through a grant from the NSF. So, I want to start off by having you all think back to the very first college science course that you ever took. And I want you to think about what you remember about that course. And I'm going to ask you to reflect and then put some short answers into the chat so that I can kind of see what you all are thinking about. Large lecture classes, um, the room is cold, excited, memorization, not remembering much. Um, what percent of you are going to fail, right? That's always a fun one. Um, uncertainty, chatting with friends during lecture. Um, lots lots of memories and lots of things that, that I kind of remember as well. Um, I remember my my instructor, I remember really liking my instructor and I thought he was really funny. Like that's what I remember um, about my experience. And um, I bring this up because I think that as college um, science instructors, we, we always really want students to answer that question with like this intense reflection on the content and like all of the things that they remembered and can spout back in terms of what we taught them. But the reality is, is that a lot of these affective um, emotions, these experiences are the things that kind of override. They're the very first things that we think of when we think back to our to our courses. And affect generally is these um, subjective feelings or experiences that are in response to a particular circumstance. Um, and it involves cognition, physiology, and emotions. And the sequence of these things is hilariously, depending on your theoretical perspective, I don't really have a theoretical perspective on that. I'm not a psychologist. Um, I'm gonna be just talking about emotion today. And specifically about emotion in these introductory science courses that a lot of us have a lot of familiarity with. Um, emotion is omnipresent in these classes. It is, um, it's actually contagious. It can move from the instructor to the student, student to student. Um, it is just a constant presence. And it is a it is a reaction to the circumstances that largely we create as instructors, right? Because as instructors, we create the teaching and learning conditions in our classes. And so we're creating these emotional responses. And these emotions are powerful. Um, they really have a lot to do with student cognition, motivation, engagement. And because of that, because of their intertwinedness with those things, um, they impact 
outcomes that we're very interested in as instructors, persistence, performance, things like that. And so I find this to be a really interesting dynamic, right? Because here we are as instructors in our large lecture classes, and we're very focused on the content and the things that we really want them to learn in our classes. And yet there's all this pesky emotion running around. And particularly in science, we tend to want to ignore it because we think, well, you know, we don't really deal with emotion in science. And so we're just going to not worry about the emotion that's going on in the classroom. And I think it's really similar to the way that kind of assessment works in the classroom. Um, I, Gibson Simpson said that assessment is the hidden curriculum. And I remember just that being so profound to me because assessment is the thing that we often don't want to think about. Uh, we get really annoyed when students are focused on grades, when they want to know what's on the exam. But these things are super important to students. And so their focus on assessment makes that um, a really kind of driving dynamic within the classroom. And we shouldn't ignore our assessment. Our assessment is important to learning. And it's much the same way with emotion, right? Emotion is a hidden curriculum too. It is intertwined with the process and the products of learning as Strain and DeMello say. And so if we ignore the emotion in the classroom, then we're actually ignoring one of the really principal ways that we can help our students to learn. So, you know, don't ignore it in the classroom. So I'm hoping today that one of the big take, home, take homes for you is, is that you understand that emotion is a hidden curriculum and that it's something we should attend to. And I'm hoping to convince you of that by talking about four different things about student anxiety that we've been looking at in my lab. Um, number one, that student anxiety is shaped by the past, um, by things that, that, that actually happen to students before they come into our classes, but that profoundly influence their current and their future perspectives in your course in the major. And that as instructors, we shape these anxiety experiences of our students. Um, that instructor support may be something critical that we can use in the classroom to finally attend to affect, to really think about how do we plan for emotion in our classroom so that we can help students learn and use emotion to help us do that. So, I'm not going to have you write in chat this time, but I do want you to think back again to that first college science course and think about some of the reasons why you felt the particular emotions that you felt. Right, give you a second to think about it. So um, this is one theoretical perspective that you can take when you're studying emotion. This is an appraisal based emotion theory. This is Peckroon's control value theory of achievement emotions. Um, and what Peckroon would say is that these emotions are generated by student appraisal of their um, perceptions and their perceived um, control over their ability to do well in the course and the value that they place on doing well in the course. And so um, if you take those two things together, um, that generates the emotions that students feel. So for example, if I'm in a, in a biology course and I, I have high value, I really want to do well on it, but I am uncertain about my ability to do well. So I'm uncertain about my control. That typically generates the emotion that we call anxiety. If I have high value in the course, but I really do not feel that I have any control over doing well in the course, then the emotion is hopelessness, which is a sad kind of emotion. Now, these two appraisals are shaped by many other things that are environmental or contextual in nature. So as an example, instructor practices, the peers in the course, your goals for why you're actually there, or even in college, your emotional predispositions, and your experiences um, that you've had in, you know, maybe science or something in the past. And these things, then, these emotions that you feel because of the environmental contextual variables impacting the appraisals of control and value, then these emotions are generated. And those emotions then are basically filtered through your individual cognitive characteristics, your motivational characteristics to actually get to the final outcome. Now, Peckroom talks about achievement as the final outcome, but there are other, certainly other outcomes that we might talk about. In our lab, we are specifically interested in instructor practices and how instructor practices can impact the appraisals of control and value that students make that then can um, arise this anxiety, um, this emotion of anxiety and what the level of anxiety is. 
And then once students have this anxiety, we're interested in how that impacts potential persistence in the biology major. So we need to talk about anxiety. Um, anxiety is one of the most prevalent emotions that students feel in our classrooms in college. Um, and it is, interestingly, it's, not, it's a prospective emotion. So that means that it is a worry or a concern about something that might happen in the future or might not. It is classified as a negative emotion, but it's interesting because it's also placed as an activating emotion. And so there are conditions under which anxiety can be a good thing. So if you have anxiety about an upcoming exam, that might activate you to study for the exam, and then you do better on that exam than you were perhaps worried about doing. Um, and so there are um, moderately good levels of anxiety that can activate you to do well. But in general, particularly if you experience high anxiety, um, high anxiety can have these negative impacts on student course performance and persistence. We've been studying anxiety in our introductory biology classes at the University of Tennessee. We have two main um, intro courses. These are for majors. Now they might be um, biology majors, but they also might be um, you know, physics majors or geology majors or something like that. Um, we have one course that is an organismal ecological course. We sometimes call that OEB. And then we have another course that is our cellular molecular course, and we sometimes call that CMB. These courses are typically taught by one instructor. They are um, typically seating about 220 students. That's about our max right now in these courses. All of the instructors use active learning to various extents. It really depends on the instructor. They use different types. Some might do a lot of group work. Some just do question and answering. Um, some do cold calling, some don't. Um, a lot of people use clickers. That's one of the most common things that people use. And we know from our research that when these um, active learning practices are deployed, that students can feel anxiety toward them, particularly question and answering in front of their peers. And so one of the first things that we wanted to do when we were first exploring anxiety was ask, okay, well, great, they have anxiety, but does that actually mean anything? Is it having any negative impacts on the students in our classes? And so we had to figure out ways to measure anxiety and then think about the outcome variables that we wanted to measure. So I'm gonna draw your attention all the way to the bottom of the slide down here. Um, down at the bottom of the slide, we have um, at week 14 in the class, we ask students whether they intend to stay in the biology major or not. That is our persistence outcome variable. And then at the end of the semester, we ask students, um, we ask the, sorry, instructors to give us the final grades for the students, and that is their performance in the class. So we look at persistence and performance as our outcome variables. So to measure anxiety, um, we have one measure that is a measure of general anxiety. It is like this overall um, kind of um, how anxious are you about the biology lecture class in general. We also ask them about their perception of the difficulty of the course. Those two are kind of tied up together in one instrument. We also ask about test anxiety, so specifically about anxiety toward assessment, social anxiety, um, specifically working in a small group, and communication anxiety, answering questions in front of your classmates, which causes a lot of anxiety. We collect these data at weeks four and weeks 14. Week four, because it's right before the first set of exams in the class, and week 14, because it's the week before Thanksgiving and we're on semesters. And so that's when things kind of are winding down for us. So we looked at these things and we were once again interested in how these might impact these uh, response variables of performance and persistence. So I'm gonna call your attention to um, the test anxiety and social anxiety results first. So um, test anxiety and social anxiety had no relationship with either performance or persistence um, for the students in our class that semester. And that's a little surprising. Test anxiety typically does have some negative impacts on performance. Um, we didn't find it. We didn't find it in another semester. So we don't really know why, but that's, that's the way it seems to be here at UT. Um, communication anxiety actually had a slightly positive impact on performance in the class. And so we think that maybe if you're nervous about um, answering a question in front of your classmates, that that might inspire you to pay closer attention just in case you are called on. And maybe that then helps you to do a little bit better in the class. Perception of difficulty, I don't think it's probably surprising to hear that perception of difficulty was negatively related to performance. And then 
we're going to look at general anxiety, which is kind of what we're going to be centered on for much of the rest of this talk. We found that general anxiety had a negative relationship with intent to persist in the major. Um, so remember, we asked that at week 14. Now, what we found was that it was the anxiety at week four that was related to intention to persist. And so if you felt high anxiety in this class at week four, then you were more likely at week 14 to say, you know, I don't think I'm going to be staying in the biology major. And so it's early anxiety that really matters, which I don't think is all that surprising. So once we knew that, we needed to know what is it that's driving early anxiety in these classes? What makes students anxious at week four or before? And the way that we approach this is um, we actually decided to deploy a survey before the semester started. Uh, we call that week zero sometimes. Um, we asked um, instructors to send this to the students and then we closed the survey before the first class meeting. So it truly is week zero. They never ever had set foot in the class before. And then of course, week four and 14. We asked them to rate their anxiety like we typically do, but then we also asked them to explain why they had that level of anxiety. And what we did is we grouped all of these responses and came up with categories um, based on when these things came up in the data set. And so what we found was that at week zero, okay, before they ever stepped, set foot in the class, the two things that were really driving anxiety was that they didn't know what to expect. That's, you know, classic definition of anxiety. And that it had been a long time since they had taken a biology course. In Tennessee, they take biology as a freshman in high school. So if they hadn't taken AP, it had been four years or more. Um, week four and uh, sorry, week zero and week four, we found that students were anxious about the size of the class and about having a bad previous biology experience. Um, and all throughout week zero, four, 14, this kind of never goes away. They were always anxious about the material being hard or complex, poor instruction, being confused or struggling to understand. And then starting at week four, but then continuing is the amount of material or the pace in the class. They felt that the class activities were unsupportive and tests and quizzes were driving their anxiety. And what I did is kind of took a look at these and kind of grouped them into three uber categories, if you will. Um, the student expectations, student prior experiences, and instructor practices, because they relate to so much of their um, confusion and anxiety about content. And we kind of put that into the model, right? So we were thinking about what are the things that really impact these control and value appraisals? Um, certainly expectations, prior experiences, and instructor practices. And if you think about the blue bubble as being one large lecture class, um, you're gonna have students, of course, that have a variety of different expectations, uh, that are gonna have a variety of different past experiences. And so I think of these two things in particular as having this like prismatic effect on these appraisals for control and value. And what they do is that they split students into this spectrum of different anxieties that we would you know, expect to see in a class. And indeed we do, right? If you um, look at anxiety and how it varies, um, like the distribution of anxiety. So on the X axis, seven is high anxiety. Y axis is number of students that are experiencing each level of anxiety. This is three classes combined. We see a bell curve distribution. It's definitely skewed toward lower anxiety, but we have this long trailing tail of students that have this high anxiety experience in their class. And so we can definitely say that it's, it's not the same experience for students in the class in terms of the anxiety that they're feeling. And we know that that has impacts then, right? Because we know that these anxiety levels can impact whether or not they're going to persist or not persist in the major. Now, of course, this can be moderated right by um, individual student cognitive and motivational um, characteristics. So some of them might be able to have high anxiety and still persist. But by and large, what we typically see is that the students that have the high anxiety are going to end up not persisting in the biology major. And so what this tells us is that there are a lot of things that are impacting the student experience before they ever get into our classes, um, that these experiences carry with them into the class. They, um, they impact the way that the students kind of perceive and take in the things that are happening to them. And then they can have impacts on what happens to them in terms of whether they want to persist in a major or stay on that career path. Um, and so that's concerning. 
but it isn't the whole story either. The other part of it is that instructors do have a role in shaping this ultimate student outcome. And so if we think about the model and we break it down into, let's say, three large lecture classes. So each of these blue bubbles is now one large lecture class, right? We know that in each of these lecture classes, there's going to be students that have a variety of um, expectations and prior experiences. But there's no reason to assume that the distribution of those things would be wildly different from lecture class to lecture class. So then instructor practices kind of take over. We as instructors each bring our own perspectives and how we teach the class. Those are going to impact control and value appraisals. And then we're going to get anxiety in each of these classes. So what is that going to look like? What we see here is we see the outcomes of that. This is five different uh, introductory biology lecture classes. Over on the far right are the codes for each one of them. It doesn't really matter what they are. Um, these are just within the same semester, five different intro bio classes. You can see that we have assessed the average class anxiety level at weeks zero, four, and 14. Um, and the scale should go all the way up to seven, but I was just trying to focus it in on the uh, trajectories of emotion here. So what you might want to notice and your eye might be drawn to is um, how different these can look. So let's look at OEB2, which is the red line. Okay, this is not the class you want to be in, right? Um, this is the class where whatever level of anxiety you started with, on average, it's going to just go up over time. And that is not typical. Typically, students have higher anxiety early at week zero, and then it drops down by week four. And so you get this like release of anxiety a little bit, not an OEB2. Now at honors, you get a pretty big release um, from your anxiety, right? That drop from week zero to week four is pretty significant. And even though it rebounds up, which is once again typical in a lot of our classes, it never even comes close to that starting initial anxiety level. And so this variation is certainly problematic in terms of equity, right? Um, it, you know, which class you're in is going to depend on your emotional anxiety experience. But on the other hand, on, on the good side, right, is that um, it basically tells us that instructors have a lot of role to play in this emotional trajectory that students um, experience. That in fact, instructor practices can be a tool for affect regulation, that we can serve as affect regulators in our classes. And I think that um, Kavanaugh has a book called The Spark of Learning. If you're interested in emotion um, in the classroom, it's fantastic. Um, and she says, intentionally crafting the impression that we make um, on students in order to maximize their motivation and learning is one of the, the profound things that we can do. And so, you know, when I'm teaching introductory biology, I can choose and use particular instructor practices that can actually make a difference in lowering student anxiety in my classroom and then therefore give students a higher probability of persisting in the major. Great. How do we do that, right? That's, that's the key. And um, that, that's the hard part. And so we've been looking at a lot of different characteristics. This has taken us out of the biology education world um, into um, a deep dive, um, a scary dive sometimes into the psychology and the communication literature where we are very unfamiliar. Um, but one of the things that, that we discovered that we found really fascinating was something called autonomy supportive practices. And this comes out of the motivation literature. Um, it is basically a way that you as a teacher can help to support the motivation of your students by supporting their autonomy. Um, and not like autonomy giving them all the control in the classroom, but their um, perceived ability to control the outcome um, for themselves in the course. And um, you can see here that anxiety and autonomy supportive practices have a negative relationship that is in the literature. And also we ran those numbers in our classes at the University of Tennessee and found that it was true there as well. And so we got really excited about this idea that maybe, you know, instructors support kind of writ large, like not specifically autonomy supportive practices, but what if we could help instructors um, be more supportive to their students? Could this be a way to moderate anxiety in our classes? 
And um, we didn't know, right? We, we knew very little about what that might look like. Um, and so we undertook a study in fall of 2019 in the before times um, and basically asked two questions, right? What do students think makes an instructor supportive? And what is it that might distinguish instructors who are um, rated by their students as either higher in support or lower in support? And to do this, we studied four of our introductory biology classes. Um, I'm going to be using um, these pseudonyms and these icons throughout um, this portion of the talk. Um, I've got their gender identities, whether they taught the organismal or the cellular course, how long they had been teaching at the University of Tennessee, and then their appointment type. Um, only Lee was a tenure line faculty, the rest were non-tenure track. To collect data, we deployed an online survey at week four because that's when anxiety matters. Uh, we asked students about their general anxiety level. Once again, seven is high. Uh, we asked them that to then rate the supportiveness of their instructor of the course. And to make it simple, we just gave them a one to 10 scale where 10 was high support. And then we asked them, why did you rate your instructor's supportiveness like that? And so they had to give us open responses to tell us why they gave that rating. Now I'm going to show here, um, this is the distribution of anxiety in each of those four classes. Um, I'm going to call attention to our um, kind of variations, right, our extremes. Um, we've got Mia on the top left in the green. Mia is a particularly um, low anxiety experience for a lot of students. Um, many of them pegged down at the one, two, and three anxiety level. None of them had a seven at all. And then we've got Ken on the kind of middle right. He's in the blue line. Ken is a high anxiety instructor. And so for students in Ken's class, they're much more likely actually to um, peg out their anxiety at four, five, six, and a, a certain amount have seven levels of anxiety, which is our highest. And I can show this here as well um, in terms of the um, average class anxiety level for each of these instructors. Once again, Ken being a high anxiety and Mia being low, and then Jan and Lee are kind of in the middle. Now, we also asked about supportiveness, right? So these are the um, class average ratings of supportiveness of each of these instructors. Uh, we can see that Ken has the lowest level of support and Mia has the highest level of support, which kind of you know works with the anxiety. And yes, there is a significant negative correlation between anxiety and support for the data set. What we really wanted to know, though, was, OK, so Ken and Jan are these lower, you know, student rated lower support, not not terribly low support, but lower than Lee and Mia. And so what is it that makes Lee and Mia different to students than Ken and Jan? And to do that, we had to um, know what to look for. Um, so we went into the data set where students had told us why they had rated their instructors um, supportiveness the way that they did. And we undertook an, an inductive qualitative analysis to basically come up with themes of instructor support. And we had five. Those are shown here. I'm not going to read the quotes, um, but I'll just go briefly through each of these. Um, so we had a relational theme where students talked about supportiveness in terms of the way it felt to communicate with their instructor, the way that they felt or perceived that their instructor felt about them in terms of their caring or their helpfulness. Um, so it was just this um, the warm and fuzzies or the not warm and fuzzies, right? This could be positive or it could be negative. Um, there was instrumental theme. Instrumental was were extra things that the instructors were doing outside of class, like offering office hours or study, you know, study sessions. Um, these were always positive. Students always liked these things. Pedagogical characteristics. These were things that students were doing in class. And critically, they were things that the students were talking about indicated whether or not they really thought that the instructor cared about their learning. So they could be positive or they could be negative. There were personality characteristics. Um, this was the way that the students thought that the instructor was as a person. Uh, they could be positive or unfortunately negative. And then there was this ambiguous theme. And ambiguous is where they weren't quite sure how to rate the supportiveness of their instructor because they hadn't talked to them. And it was a large class. And so they just didn't know what to put. So here what I've done is I have organized those themes um, by rating of instructor support. So you can see on the X axis, it goes up to 10, which is our highest level of instructor support. And I've just basically sorted the themes that went along with each of the ratings that the students provided, because I want to show you the trend here, right? So if you look all the way on the left, 
at the number one, low support. The things that students mostly talked about were negative pedagogical characteristics and negative relational characteristics. And then let's go to the non-dark side, um, all the way over to the positive, you know, high support. We see a lot of positive pedagogical characteristics. We see a lot of instrumental, not as many as pedagogical, and we see positive relational characteristics. So that kind of told us the overall scene in terms of these themes. But what we really wanted to get to, right, was what is it that makes Lee and Mia different from Jan and Ken? Remembering that Ken and Jan on the left are our lower support instructors and Lee and Mia are our higher support instructors. So we organized the themes by what students in their classes said about them. And what I'm going to do is just basically show two things that I think were overall different about them. If I look at the positive characteristics, right, um, if you see the blue bar, the blue bar is positive relational. There seems to be a pretty decent difference between Ken and Jan and Lee and Mia. And it seems that Lee and Mia really had a lot of students who were talking about these positive relational, like they cared about us, you know, they really, they were there to help us. Um, those things kind of shown through for Lee and Mia. And then the other thing that was really striking was on the kind of negative side of things or the neutral was um, Ken and Jan had a, a, a fairly high amount of negative pedagogical characteristics. Lee and Mia had almost none. Like students really didn't talk about how their pedagogy in their class um, was not helping their learning. They were talking always about how fantastic it was for helping them to learn. But Ken and Jan got a lot of kind of negative feedback about their pedagogies. And so this tells us something interesting, right? Is that we as instructors, if we really want to attend to emotion in the classroom, and specifically if I as an instructor want to drive anxiety down in my classroom, then I need to attend to positive relational characteristics and make sure that I'm doing my pedagogy correct so that I'm not getting these negative pedagogical things. And I need to plan for that. And I think that that's something that's really hard because it's not something that we really talk about, right? We're taught how to create lectures. We're taught how to write assessments. We're not taught how to gesture appropriately to you know, help enhance a sense of community in the classroom. But I wanna say that these things are actually important. Words, the words that we use in the class are wildly important. The way that we move around the classroom um, we can move around the classroom, we can gesture, we can make eye contact, and those things um, actually help to create something that's called immediacy. This is in the communication literature. It closes the psychological distance between instructors and students. Um, our deeds, the way that we act around our students, and then our policies, right? Do we have policies that are accommodating that help students to know that they can come to us if things are going on in their lives? Or are they very black and white where we're like, no, no, sorry, you don't get to take the exam. And so all of these things are in a toolkit for helping us to plan for emotion in the classroom. And so just to go through a few examples here, um, I have written here on the left some positive emotional characteristics. These are things that students expressed that made them say that that their instructors were um, positive relationally done. Um, and I just want to go through some things I've thought about. So maybe I want to use words, right? Um, and this is kind of a simple thing, and I think we don't do it enough, right? How would I just tell students that I really want them to succeed in the class or that I'm there to help them? say these things right out and maybe maybe even put them on a slide at the beginning of the of the lecture or something i want to use nonverbal gestures and maybe move them around the classroom to indicate approachability to my students i want to demonstrate helpfulness to my students by not blowing out of the classroom you know <laughs> at the very end of the lecture and not you know not actually stopping and pausing and seeing if anybody has any questions to ask me and i need to have policies for extenuating circumstances and then for things like pedagogical, ask if they're confused, acknowledge their confusion, attend to body language, and allow them to demonstrate their learning in multiple ways. The other thing I want to point out is that if we do these things, we can build more equitable environments. And so here I've got anxiety on the x-axis and support on the y-axis. I just want to show you how different these two distributions are. If you have high support, like Lee and Mia at the bottom, then what we see is that um, the support that these students um, experience is more equitable across these different anxiety levels. 
for Ken and Jan, what we see is that the experience is really different if you're a high anxiety versus a low anxiety student. And I think that that makes a big difference. So we have to remember that our instructor practices impact anxiety, but student anxiety impacts their perception of our practices. And so finally, I just want to say that emotions can be moderated. That emotion is the hidden curriculum, but we can bring it into the light. We can use words, gestures, deeds, policies to plan to actually help the emotional experience. And students attend to these things. We know they do, right, from our data set. They are watching these things as cues. And so I think that we need to pay as much attention to them as the students are paying attention to us doing these things. And with that, I'm going to close things down and you all can ask me questions that you have. Uh, thank you so much. Um, there are so many good questions for you. <laughs> I did some very impromptu thematic analysis. Nice, nice. And I'm going to try and ask some questions that popped up multiple times. Okay. So some of the big questions surrounded relationship between student identity and anxiety and then instructor identity and anxiety. Can you touch on both of those? Yeah, yeah. And I wish that I had more data on that. Um, so, you know, A number one, University of Tennessee is not known for its um, wild diversity. Um, and so it's really hard for us to, to sometimes uh, disambiguate data in that way. People have asked us in the support um, data set, for example, they asked us whether or not they thought that students perceived the male and the female, or the man and the woman um, instructors as um, different. We saw no evidence of that. Um, we didn't see any comments that referred to anything about gender. Um, certainly, you know, we had uh, a man and a woman who were high support, a man and a woman who were low support. So it didn't sort out that, you know, the men were rated as high support. Um, and we, the only thing that we've seen is, and this is kind of weird because it might be um, politics based, honestly, um, is in 2016, we did see that gender being female impact um, impacted persistence. So they had higher anxiety and it more negatively impacted their persistence. And we never saw that again. And I'm not so sure it wasn't a political, I, I'm just blaming Trump on that one. That's all I have to say. So I wonder one person posed, for example, um, if maybe certain active learning practices could have differential effects. Um, for example, for underrepresented students who are also facing stereotype threat, like cold calling, for example, did you observe? Um, you know, I think so. So the work that Katie Cooper and Sarah Brunell have done on this, so they've done a lot of work um, on um, student anxiety in bio classrooms. And I, I feel like the work that they have have done has indicated that actually it's the small group work that might be more threatening to students because that is when those um, student identities really matter when you have to circle up with a group of people in a large lecture class that you don't know and um, and suddenly um, your identity matters and and you know people are kind of looking at you and you're conscious of it and so their work would indicate that actually the group work um, clickers can be rather anonymous um, and you know answering a question in front of a class um, hilariously causes them a lot of anxiety even when it's just a volunteer to answer i'm just like why are you nervous you don't have to do it but they feel very anxious about it um i would imagine cold calling might if it's not done equitably i do think cold calling has the potential to be um, harmful depending on how the instructor is is doing it okay and i'm just going to read Alex's question, because it's written so effectively. It's sometimes expected that women and minorities, fac uh, women and minority faculty provide the affective labor. Mm -hmm. How is that related to the approach that faculty take on the classrooms or how they position themselves in front of their classrooms? Uh, is As a follow-up, is there any relationship between the gender identity, race, ethnicity to levels of anxiety perceived by students? So, okay, so that was asking about the instructor, but then, yep. so is this, is this another like interaction between the, sorry, I should be looking at this myself, but I probably can't find it. Um, no, you're okay. So we'll just, I put two questions together. Okay, um, so, that's 
<laughs> we know that minorities and women often provide the effective labor. So I guess how's that related to the approach that these faculty are using in the classrooms and how they position themselves in their classes? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, and this is, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb because I don't have data that can specifically answer that question. But I think that in the support data, for example, um, when I think about an instructor like Jan, I'm, I'm very familiar with all of these instructors. I watch them quite a bit. I think that um, that one of the things that impedes Jan in particular is that because she is a woman, there are certain expectations that she is going to be warm and fuzzy in the classroom, that she is going to be more approachable. And I think that that isn't her style. Um, and because of that, I think that she does suffer in the um, in the support of ratings because her practices are perfect. I mean, when I watch, I'm like, that is perfect active learning implementation. And I'm always surprised at her ratings because, um, and I really think it is um, that she isn't as warm and fuzzy um, as she should be. Um, certainly, I don't, it's, it's, and I also think Lee on the on the flip side, um, Lee is, um, you know, he's a man, but very approachable, very gregarious. And I think that that probably does really help because it's not um, not expected that that you might see that, you know, in in somebody who is a, a man. OK, and I was also wanting so much of this. Can you give some examples of autonomy supportive practices? So it's, it, and I'm really having to dive back in, into my memory here. So um, autonomy supportive practices are things like um, you can offer choice. So for example, one of the classic things that you could do as an instructor, and by the way, this comes out of the K to 12 um, teaching world. And so some of it is a little hard to translate, but maybe you have assignments where students have a choice in which one of the assignments that they, that they complete. Um, but it is also about listening to students, about being explicit that when they have concerns in the class, that you are willing to listen to them, that you're willing to make adjustments to your practices so that they feel that they are um, contributing to the class as well and that you are responsive to them and listening to their concerns. And so it's about trust. It's about having, having um, I think the instructor having the students back to a certain extent. And so there's a lot of relational things that go into that. But then I think also some some policy choices or the way that you structure your course. So then a few people were wondering about uh, anxiety in the COVID area era era. Oops. I'm wondering if you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so I have not done any surveys of students um, in the in the current COVID pandemic. Um, I thought real hard about it. Um, you know, I have a, I've been regularly collecting these data since 2015, um, but I I didn't feel comfortable deploying the surveys um, when things were so chaotic and instructors were so hard pressed to do what they were doing. Students were feeling overwhelmed. And so I chose not to collect any data at all. I haven't collected any data since um, uh, we started to collect data in spring of 2020 and then we just stopped. Um, our spring, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I cannot personally say anything now, now how, you know, the things that I know now about relational and pedagogical characteristics, right? Um, how do you do relational characteristics, you know, in an online like little square, you know, like you can't walk, walk around the room in the same way, you know, you can't do eye contact, God forbid, eye contact, you know, um, you can't, you know, I can, I gesture, but it's kind of, it feels like a little bit like a tiny little puppet, you know, and so I'm not sure if that's, you know, the same way at all. Um, and I think our practices are really kind of um, different. And so I think there is no way that it isn't impacting things. But I did ask and in, in toward the end of spring 2020 about um, student perceptions of instructor supportiveness because the instructors wanted to know how that was going as they transitioned to online. And I was surprised um, students felt very supported. They felt like the instructors were really doing what they could. But I also think that that was kind of that emergency transition. And I'm not so sure that that isn't, um, wouldn't be different in this kind of like, well, you've had a year now, you, you've planned for this, you know, why haven't you gotten this right yet? Well, let us all just take a second to thank uh, Beth again for a wonderful talk. That was really great. Um, and I think we have a tiny break or we go straight.
Oh, let me check one more time. We have a tiny 15 minute break. Okay. But really, thank you, Beth. This was, sure. you told such a good story. I'm, I'm really happy. <laughs> I meant to start my timer and I totally forgot. So I was checking the time and I was like, I don't know how long I've gone. I oh, I didn't even have to try. You were so perfectly on time. Yes, <laughs> never on time. I'm all, I always run later than I practice. Like it just annoys the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Scrolling some of the comments. Um, one colleague sent me 